Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Andy Parker, the UX coach, and this is where I share people's stories of career success and failure from across the tech industry. Today I'm talking to Marvin Hassan, a UX designer from Germany who wants to pay back the community with his insights into design leadership and navigating the different phases of tech startups. What is the role of a designer when a business is operating on VC money? How do you create great products when the mission is to pay back your debt? We'll be talking about all of these things and more in this episode. Before I hand you over to Marvin, I wanted to share some news about UX Coaching. We're running a special offer to help you rewire your mind for success in 2024. If you book a coaching package between now and the end of January, you will receive a 20% discount. To find out more, head over to theuxcoach.com. Over to Marvin. Someone that didn't uh, didn't consider themselves to be very creative when I left school. I originally got my um, my Abitur, is what they call it in Germany, um, and then went on to study business. I, I actually went for an MBA, and since I come from a working class family, I always had to kind of work on, on the side and you know make sure that all the bills were paid. I worked in a travel agency, and while I was doing that, you know, the, this was like the early t- times of travel agencies going online and, and kind of checking out what the market was was doing there for them. I experimented with HTML and kind of just writing my first kind of websites on my own. And my boss in the travel agency said, well, if you're doing this at home and if you're interested, why don't you just, you know, build our website? And that's kind of what, what got me started. And then I noticed that I was working quite a lot and I wasn't very focused on my um, education or my studies anymore. And I quit. I quit studying business administration. And then after a while, um, I went to private academy to, to study design. And then I found myself in a, in a crowd of hugely, immensely creative people. And that was like the first time imposter syndrome really hit, but I was, I was getting the grades. I was, you know, kind of being successful in there. And yeah, I, I got my degree diploma as a, as a designer for new media, it was called back then. And basically from then on, I kind of did a lot of web design and, and marketing design and stuff like that. So new media, uh, I think if it's kind of the same as what we have here in uh, the UK, covers everything from like photography to print works to videography, like film work yes. and things like that. Is it still the same for you? Yes, it was. It was uh, v- really, really broad. And I think that's also um, a real benefit to you know how education works today in a lot of areas, right? Where it's so focused on just you know getting the programs out. I really had the chance to explore what part of this creative life I wanted to get into. What happens next? What happens after that? So you've graduated, you've already dabbled a little bit with web design in a previous job before sort of heading back to those studies Mm -hmm. what what was your first sort of step into that creative career well unfortunately the the travel agency you know was hit pretty hard when a lot of large companies started um you know going online and they just weren't able to compete so Mm. i i left that job and right out of the academy i basically went self-employed we we started a small agency with a few friends and did a lot of websites a lot of you know marketing related stuff, any, anything from corporate design all the way to kind of first online shops for a, a bunch of SMBs. So anywhere from roofers that would, you know, just doing the, the handiwork um, to shops selling beanies and stuff like that. So I, I kind of immediately went into, okay, I'm going to do this on my own now. I think that's really cool. And it's something that I try and encourage a lot of people to do now if, rather than going and looking for the job with the big corporation and all of that of just to try and do something yourself and I know that you've kind of come full circle in a little bit and are starting to move in that direction again now Mm -hmm. you've also worked for a number of businesses and you've you've very much developed a uh, a career not necessarily in the traditional sense but you have progressed in terms of your seniority and capability uh, and then obviously focused very much into a user experience design field. Whereas I guess when you were starting out, you were kind of doing everything. You were mm-hmm. building sites, working out, hosting and doing all of the other things. Or what was the sort of motivation from working for yourself to then going and finding employment in 
um, you know, in a larger company? Well, actually, it was a, a few things. For one, I relatively soon kind of noticed that all this marketing work was kind of nice and, and it was a lot of creating pretty things. But I always thought that design had this unique capability of making complex things understandable for every everyone out there, right? So I wanted to do more of that. And then a friend of mine actually introduced me to UX the, at the UX Bar Camp uh, Europe here. Um, he was one of the very early members of that kind of group. And he said, well, why don't you join us there? And ever since I, I went to that first bar camp, I, I was just hooked. I was just uh, in this immediate feeling of these are my people. This is what I want to be doing. And I haven't left it since. So that was really, you know, one of the big things. And then joining a corporation, I actually was in politics for a while as, as kind of like a, a side gig, if you will. I ran for office here in Berlin and I noticed that my freelance work and, you know, politics and kind of all of that, you know, and having a life outside of, and, you know, work didn't work as well as I, I thought. So then I kind of went to into this secure area of full-time employment at a company, working with a team where I didn't have to wear all the hats and do all the things all the time. I could really focus on UX and creating uh, products and stuff like that. Do you find yourself in uh, working in a business? Were you one of many people in design or was did you experience the challenges of like, I'm the only person that does this thing in this company? What was oh, that yeah. like? Oh, yeah, definitely. I, I wish I would have been uh, in an organization where there was, you know, there was a lot of support and a lot of people I would, was able to learn from at the beginning. You know, you get into UX, I think it, it can be quite a steep learning journey. And if you're doing it on your own, I mean, you have great chances of being impactful and kind of learning on the job. And I, I think that helps build practice really quickly. But it can also be very lonely because you're the only one in the organization that kind of thinks like you do and kind of approaches problems like you do. So no, at the, at the beginning, I was the only designer in the in the team. And yeah, that kind of has, has stayed consistent. I'm, I was always one of them, the more senior people, if not the most senior UX person in my in my job ever since then. That's a big challenge that many people face, right? And it's definitely one that we've talked about a lot on the show in the past. There are quite often instances where you are the design team of one. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't really matter how big that company is either, right? Sometimes really big companies, you might be the only person that's that's involved in that particular role. You mentioned started to explore user experience design through going to um to UX bar camp. What kind of role do you see that peer development having in your ability to be able to expand your skill set and your capabilities, things like that UX bar camp? I think it's it's crucial to exchange with the network and the community um, if you want to progress. For me it's it's always been on the one side kind of a check-in to see how I was doing, what was the, you know, how up to par was I with the stuff I, I was learning really. Even maybe more importantly was the connection you felt being in this, you know, as you said, team of one, you finally got to exchange with someone and, and get a bit of a reality check on how they were approaching things and what they were struggling with. I always say these the UX Camp Europe here is like a family gathering. And at the first day, it's, it's a, everyone's like, yeah, I'm great. And, you know, everything's going great. And we're being so impactful. Then, you know, once people let down their guard a bit on Saturday evening, Everyone's like, yeah, but then I have to struggle with uh, product management giving me kind of orders and I'm, you know, I don't get to do the full process. And stuff. And while it can seem like frustrating, we have this kind of curve of letting down guards and then being honest and then sharing our, you know, our, our challenges as well. I think it's really, really helpful to see that, you know, it's not on you necessarily. It's just the state of the industry in a lot of cases and there's ways to work around it. There's ways to learn from each other. And I think the best thing you can do at any stage in your career is stay connected to the, the people who are like you and who are in the same field. You mentioned before that you, you've always been the most senior person within the organizations that you've, you've been at. And sometimes that is yeah. down to size, not just the fact that you have decades of experience. I'm very curious to sort of understand the differences in some of those roles and responsibilities, because if you were to go and look at your career history, you've held quite dynamic job titles. So there's like art director mm -hmm. and uh, head of design, head of UX design, director of user experience, those kinds of 
titles, are they all saying the same thing or do they have different responsibility? First of all, I don't, I don't think they're all the same, but I do think that the, we don't yet have a standard for all of them, right? So what what's a head of design in one organization can be a director in a different organization. I've seen that, that happen and, or, or just a team manager in, in a different organization. What I've experienced is that the head of usually or often is the leader of the design team if there's no one else there, right? If there's if the team is small enough, then usually that person becomes like the head of, of the team and the head of the department, the discipline. Directors, however, are much closer to executive management. They're not quite at that level yet, so you're not VP yet. But what you are responsible for is a larger part of the organization. Usually you would lead multiple teams. Of, of design, right? So you'd you'd probably just be managing managers, yes. and as a head of, you're still kind of working with, a lot with individual contributors. But your responsibility for the outcomes of um, a larger part of the organization's kind of shift, right? As a head of design, I found myself being largely responsible for what the design team was able to deliver, what our processes were, how you know the output really that that we were able to do. But as a director of design, my job was much more aligning with. I was actually, I mean, product and engineering, Arjun, you know, I was held responsible for what the entire product design and, and you know, and, and engineering departments would, would be able to deliver. So the real product that we are putting out and the outcomes yeah. of that, you're much closer to company strategy and influencing that and being a part of those kind of decisions and discussions. But if you look towards, you know, career building and what, what someone that is trying to move up might might look for, I think there's a few things that you really have to be careful of, right? We're, we're designers for a reason. One of the things I had to learn the hard way is that the more you move up the ranks, the less you actually get to work with just designers and work on the stuff that you're you're passionate about and you have to do other things. So letting go of not only hands-on design, but also of working with your people, your crowd, um, can be difficult. You have to be prepared for that. And we, in design, especially in UX, we always talk about having the seat at the table, you know, involved in, in discussions about strategy and where the company should head. Well, I see that being impactful and important. Two things, in my opinion, that need to, need to be, you know, we need to be aware of. One is um, the company, the organization needs to be ready for design to have that discussion. It doesn't just, you know, happen organically. If you're just invited to the table, that doesn't necessarily mean you're, you're being impactful. You're just sitting there. Friend of mine says, "Well, we're in a we're in a, we're on a kid's seat at that table, <laughs> so it doesn't really you know it doesn't really help much." The, the other thing is that you and your design organization really have to be ready to discuss at that level, right? It doesn't make any sense if your processes, um, your your own UX maturity isn't at the level where you you're free and you have enough headspace to contribute to strategy. If that is the case, I'd rather keep focusing on getting your own stuff running first, and then when you're ready come to the discussion at, at the executive table or at the strategy table because it you know it doesn't make sense to bring figma files there and kind of discuss that that's not something that should be discussed in, at that level so make sure your organization is ready to have design at that table and and have you know have you join discussions and make sure that you as a as a design team are actually ready to have those kind of discussions otherwise it's just a waste of time just a waste of capacity and it's frustrating for everyone i wanted to ask you what the motivations or the triggers were for you to move out of being an individual contributor being a practitioner who was developing designing and testing the products and services that you had in the company to looking at the operational side of things is it something that has happened because a, a role became available and you apply for it because you're talking about being aware of what the maturity is of the business right and and the people that are running the business was there someone there already that was doing that job they've moved on and so the opportunity is there or have you created it it's actually a bit of both. The first time I stepped into management role was was rather unexpected. I joined a company where there was someone on board that I, I thought I could learn from. That person left like nine days after I joined the company. And so the position opened up. So, um, yeah, there was no one there to manage the design team anymore. And the position was open. And I have a tendency to just kind of jump in, in the deep end. So I applied for it, got the job. And then I started, you know, building the design team, the processes, and, you know, UX maturity from there on. So in the last role, 
I was basically hired to do that. They they noticed that they had a few designers on board, but they weren't, you know, delivering at the level that they were expected to, and the, the organization was growing, so they just needed someone to come in and, and, and kind of handle that. So I've always kind of been more of the, the builder of design teams and organizations, and it's also where I've, you know, kind of find my my comfort zone. I uh, Maybe not everyone would agree that that's the, the most fun part, but for me it definitely is. And in terms of motivation, and this is something I, I – just realized relatively late in my career and looking back kind of is that for me, it's largely been about the people and working with the people more than what products we're building. And I always wanted to have a team of designers that could just, you know, come together and inspire each other and do great things as a team. And since that hadn't been handed to me in a way, I just started building those teams wherever I could. And I still enjoy that today. Do you think that um, that being in this position where what you're interested in is is being able to develop the capability and, and the environment for people to be able to do great things in, it, it relates to the maturity in general of, of where businesses are in Germany today? Interesting question. I think there's not too much of a difference internationally. When I talk to designers and I work with designers internationally, they all kind of seem to you know, experience the same kind of struggles. And yes, depending on the organization and how, how big the, the tech and startup scene is in a certain area, there's differences in maturity, right? You can be further along, even though you don't have necessarily a great big team. It just depends on how committed your upper management, and by this, I mean, the c that has to start with them, is to actually building products. Every startup, every tech company has, you know, something along those the lines of, oh, we obsess about our customers in their value set. Very few of them actually do that. I think it's in part because it's just, you know, in vogue and you, that's just a, a part of the story you tell your, you know, your, your VCs basically. Yeah. And I don't think, I don't think there's a, there's a huge difference in terms of Germany versus another country. Maybe obviously the, the Valley, right. But still there, I, I still see people coming up and say, Hey, um, you know, I, I have all these methods here and I only get to use parts of them. And, I, you know, the design process is never as I, as I would like it to run. One thing I've come to realize, especially in these tech companies, is that we have to be honest about companies often are in kind of two markets, right? One is the market where they actually run their products. And the other is getting money. And as soon as money runs out, your product is going to be less important. You're going to have to tell another story to VCs to get more, more runway, to get more money. And mm -hmm. then, you know, attention kind of shifts away from customer obsession and, and from building great products to how do we get, you know, great market share? How do we hit our KPIs so we have a convincing story for the people who give us money? You know, so once you're aware of that and you realize that that's how businesses in that area kind of run, I think you can have a more realistic picture of what you can achieve. It's got me thinking quite a lot about whether there is an unmet skill set within the design community for the differences between designing for the product in the sense that you have a product so like your description there I, i've got an established business that has a uh, returning profit every single year we have a thing we sell it we make money we continue to grow because we make profit on what we sell and that goes on for however long. You're right, it's completely different to the environment that you step into when you're a startup in particular, where the amount of money that the company has effectively borrowed is significantly greater than the amount of money it's going to return within a year. So there's this constant question about who you're there for. As, mm -hmm. you know, as a designer, but as a company as well, are you there for your end customer for that product? Or are you actually there to uh, return the investment from a VC? Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe there's something there that's missing. Maybe that's something that we should be exploring as designers is how do you communicate and design for venture capitalists and the organizations that sit with all of that money? Mm -hmm. You know, you gave the description before of, having your seat at the table, so to speak, within the management team and the senior team. And we think about that quite a lot. What happens when there's that additional tier that you might not be aware of? 
uh, which is ultimately where the money actually comes from right now for this business until it makes profit. Have you had much experience with um, uh, venture capitalists in any of the businesses you've been with? I've been in a few um, companies that have been financed by outside money. Let's call it that in, in both, you know, occasions and or in all occasions that kind of there's always this this shift when you see you know you're not hitting hitting your muscles but we're building we're building something that's great but we see that there's you know not as much traction as we'd like and market may be shifting due to outside conditions and then attention goes goes away from building great products for the time being and i think that's totally okay when you, when you spoke about what skills are we missing i think for me it's it's one very important thing that is um, design is a part of that that business. We serve the, the business, and yes, the business obviously needs to serve customers and needs to provide great experiences. Otherwise, it doesn't sell. But it's it's a means to an end, right? And if we put ourselves in service to that business, we can do that proudly as designers. I always kind of struggle with the idea that designers seem to be always reaching for a way to be impactful, a way to do things that is, you know that is different from design. Why not just say, hey, we're great at design. We build great products. This is how we contribute to what this company is achieving, period, right? Why does it always have to be something else, something in addition to design? I think we're kind of devaluing our own work. We're, we're not as proud as we used to be. When I, when I started, there was these stars I look up to. And I, I don't necessarily believe in design rock stars. I don't want to work with any of them, but there was something... That you know, designers were just proud of what they were doing. I don't feel that as much anymore. It's all mm -hmm. about becoming more, becoming outside of, you know, being impactful outside, being the, the ones that drive the organization. Why not just drive design? Why not, you know, just do great creative work and be content with that and then grow from there and then engage others and involve others and, and grow the maturity from there. I don't necessarily think we need to always step outside of our craft to be impactful. That idea of like the inspirational designers in digital, that's definitely a non-existent thing now. Like if I think even 10 years ago, there would still be a handful of people who I really liked anything, any project they worked on. I really liked the way that it looked. I liked the way that it felt, it moved, it, it operated. That does not seem to be the case anymore. And I wonder whether digital design has become industrialized. You know, it's, it's, it's more manufacture than it is art. If you think back to when we were pushing the boundaries of the capability of what can this medium do, you know, you leave school and education and you go and do your own thing. And you said before about, you know, we were doing things and it was like, we were really happy with how they looked and, you know, they looked great and everything. And um, I don't know whether that's still the case. I don't, I don't really see it anymore. What, what do you think? I would that? totally agree. And I'm, I'm, I actually miss it quite a lot. I think it's in part due to, like you said, right. It's, it's just so industrialized. You can, you know, you, and there, there's so many systems and it's really easy to, you know, produce something that is visually appealing. So that, doesn't it's like a commodity it doesn't really count anymore but i also think that we focus so much on impacting organizations and growing out of the those right, uh, that all the people that have experience and leaders are either frustrated and leave the industry i heard one of my very good friends recently call it innovations theater he, he felt like we're not actually doing anything anymore we're just you know repeating the, the same the same kind of exercise without anything moving forward. And this is a person that has contributed to the to the um, field for 20-something years. So he, he knows his stuff, but still, it's like, yeah, this level of frustration has crept in and they're kind of stuck in, the, in those roles. And I wonder if there aren't roles, not necessarily job titles, mm. but roles that we're missing that we, we're not investing in because we don't value them as much anymore. Like, you know, there's obviously influencers or, you know, creators now, and a lot of people are doing that as part of their marketing for, you know, courses or whatever they sell. But I think there's a real value in communicating great stuff in the in the in the community without, you know, necessarily having a course behind it, right? Just be a UX evangelist, if you will, for for us, for the for the whole in industry. Become educators, you know, stuff like that. And you don't have to be the director of design of some company 
to be impactful in this field. It doesn't really matter. It's just the job title. But I think that's it, it almost feels like that's the only thing we see, you know, up the ladder and become managers so you can have that big paycheck or an exit at some point or have a seat at the table. But why not just stay designers, right? The, the traditional career ladder always sees people move out of uh, that space uh, into more of the areas that you've explored. So thinking about people management, organizational design and things like that and moving further and further away from the tools and the craft. And perhaps that's where some of that commoditization is coming from. Mm -hmm. You're starting kind of a similar path, stepping away from that mm -hmm. uh, more traditional management sort of role within organizations. Um, tell us a little bit about that. As so many, I was let go at the end of the year and um, my team was pretty much all of them had, had been let go. So there was no, no real people management role because there were no more people there to manage. I found out that, like like I said earlier, right, for me, it's always been about the people and enabling people and empowering designers. And I found that through mentoring, which I'd already been doing on the side and a bit of coaching, I actually worked with through this with the coach myself. I found that I could still do this work, but not necessarily only in an organization and reaching out to different people in, in the community, helping you know them find their path and design and kind of deal with the challenges that we all had gone through and also kind of rekindle the flame a bit, right? Um, was something that I love doing and, you know, would let me be impactful beyond just my immediate team. I'm going all in this year. I'm going to be self-employed again as a, as a coach and team coach and interims managers, you know, so I can reach out to different teams and organization and individuals in the UX industry and, see how I can help them progress, build maturity, find a path and that's true to them and their values. Do you think that it will provide you with an opportunity to uh, get back to actually like thinking some things through and designing things as well? Yeah, in a, in a way it is because I now get to design um, different kinds of products, products that just serve our industry directly, right? So it's um, I have to work on, you know, my coaching methods and, and how those function i have to kind of hands-on design um my my own kind of material and i i see a lot of joy in that you've worked for yourself you've been a freelancer you've been a contractor you've started businesses you've worked for other organizations how do you make the decision as to whether that is something that you want to explore is is it something that's natural do you think to people, there's some people that just feel, I want to do my own thing? W would you try and encourage people to to try and, and build their own thing? What's the sort of the guidance and advice there and the thought processes of when faced with the the question of do I do I start my own thing? Do I start my own business? Do I go freelance or do I find a job in a company? How do I answer this without sounding fencing? Well, the the first thing is, at the beginning, I probably wouldn't wouldn't do it anymore. At the very start of my career, it was really tough. Uh, there was a lot of ramen profitable and kind of just, you know, um, not making enough money. And I wish I would have given myself a, a bit more time to learn because, as a, so, you know, as, as soon as you go self-employed, you wear all the hats. You have to, you know, just just do so much that is out of outside of design that um, I wish I would have given myself more time to just explore that field that I was so passionate about that I really wanted to be, um, you know, doing. So yeah, that's probably my advice. Don't, don't do it like as your first thing, but once you have a bit of, you know, skills under your belt, you've experienced a few years of doing the work. Um, I think it's always great to try out side projects. I think those can be really enriching. I always encourage the designers on my teams to do other stuff on the side because um, the work in the company can be very bread and butter and you still want to have a bit of creative outlet and those can turn into products and can turn into big companies. Yeah, once you once you have that under your belt and you feel comfortable and kind of diving into the deep end and just trying things out, go for it, especially if you don't have too many things that you have to kind of be careful of. I mean, I now have two kids and a wife that need me to contribute to our family income in a way, in a substantial way. So that puts a bit more pressure on, but I also have, you know, more than 20 years experience in the industry and I'm calm 
in a way that I wasn't before. So it kind of kind of levels it out, I guess. I think it's worth a try, and I think it can be really, really rewarding for uh, designers to go freelance because you know you get to focus on your skill without necessarily going through all the the politics of an organization. But if you're very risk averse, maybe stay in the company and that, you know, just stay in the comfort zone. You can still be doing great work and, you know, have a relaxing life kind of. With a lot of designers, I've, I I see that we very closely identify with the job and we're like, it's more than just our job. We are designers kind of, right? So there's a, a large tendency to, you know, take that outside of an organization as well. Um, but I think there can be room for people to just have a design job and be something else on the side, be a soccer trainer, be, you know, whatever. And that's totally fine as well, right? Be aware of what it is you want, what's important to you, what really drives you. And if then that turns out to be, yeah, I want to run my own design studio and that's who I am, that's what I want to do. Great, go for it, right? Big thanks to Marvin Hassan for joining me on the podcast and thank you for listening. There'll be more episodes coming soon. And as always, if you'd like to talk to me about coaching or to be a guest on this show, you can email me, andy at theuxcoach.com or come find me on Instagram, Facebook or LinkedIn. See you soon.